is one of thousands of drive-by towns across the Lone Star State, known mostly to the people who live outside of it for the fuel stop out along the interstate. For the hard-working townspeople who live there, Cranesville, Texas is a community of warmth and charm. Founded in 1892, the tiny rural town has remained quiet since then. Until earlier this year. On March 16th, an explosion rocked this small town. The blast occurred at the old, long-abandoned Crane Cove factory just outside the city limits. The colossal explosion, which measured as a 2.1 magnitude tremor, shook structures and cracked windows throughout the town. Only a few dozen minor injuries were reported and no casualties. A few witnesses to the immediate aftermath of the explosion reported a strange green mist spreading out towards the town from the site of the explosion. Before any answers were to be had, an unmarked brigade of vehicles rolled into town. These were presumed to be the National Guard by many of the townspeople, on the ground in response to a potential environmental crisis. But the troops that descended on the town of Cranesville had no obvious military markings on their uniforms. A mysterious occupation was occurring. A tent city formed around the blast site with men in uniforms, lab coats, and hazmat suits entering and exiting at all hours of the day and night. Meanwhile, the townspeople were ordered via text message to stay in their homes. This suspended state of confusion went on for weeks. Citizens were essentially on lockdown, unable to wander their own neighborhoods. Supplies were delivered on doorsteps, and time seemed to drag on. Approximately one month later, the strange military force rolled back out of the town as suddenly as they had originally materialized. They left in their wake many more unanswered questions, feelings of frustration, and a small town shaken. This is the story of a blast in Cranesville, told by the people who lived through it, the citizens themselves. The day before the explosion was just a typical day for me. I woke up in the firehouse after a not-so-great night's sleep that had been interrupted by my dad, the fire chief. He had decided to run a timed drill in the middle of the night. I was the first to the truck, as always, but my dad ignored that and focused on the guys lagging behind. After the drill, we got back to the firehouse around sunrise, and I decided to jog a few miles. For some reason, I jogged a bit further out to the edge of town than usual. I stopped to take a break next to this Cranesville sign and just sort of sat and stared down the long road. This town. Finally, I came back to the station where a call had just come in about a girl's kitten stuck in a tree. I ended up having to climb the tree since the chief said we didn't need to use the truck for it and no one else volunteered to do it. <sighs> the rest of the day was spent washing and prepping the truck, and I made some dinner for the guys. It was a slow night, so I started to read a book about meteorology that I had picked up at the library. Rachel, the librarian there, is always recommending good stuff to me. When I was younger, I always wanted to be a weatherman. My dad... However, had other ideas. He wanted me to be like him and started to pressure me into firefighting when I turned about 13. We had just lost my mother and he was all I had. How could I disappoint him? That's, uh, that's how I ended up staying in Cranesville. But I fell asleep with the book on my lap. It was nothing new, nothing old, just a day. That was about to change. What's great about Cranesville, probably the best thing about Cranesville, is its citizens. There's this uh, diversity and uniqueness that each person brings, and those uh, individual sparks grow into a bright, bustling community. Everybody knows everybody, and if you didn't, well, that's just one more friend you've got to make. I, I was born and raised in Cranesville, and aside from college in New York, I have lived here just about my whole life. In fact, my parents owned a farm that's been in our family since uh, the 1880s. Farming is tough work, but 
hey, it's gotta be done. Growing up in the uh, post-World War II uh, atomic age, interests shifted from uh, agriculture to technology. Times were changing, and I figured I had to grow with the times too. And that's why I ran for office, to help this town grow. And I'm proud to have been elected mayor of Cranesville. Before politics, I studied electrical engineering. It's how I got a job at the factory on the edge of town. <laughs> that factory's been there since my family's farm. Since Cranesville was settled, in fact. There was an opening in the fall of uh, 1989, and me, trying to move on from farming, I applied. I could not tell you what the job was. The application didn't say. All I knew was that it was open and paid well. Uh, it was a short job. I worked only a few days. I was still being oriented around when something happened. Uh, alarms blared. Everyone was evacuated. And then, then, then this bright green light came from inside the factory. I'd never seen anything like it. The day after, the factory closed. Indefinitely. <laughs> Haven't given much thought to the place in years until, you know... It exploded. Cranesville. Some refer to it as the greatest little town, and some refer to it as a weird little town. Either way, I think they'd be right. I have an herbal massage therapy business here using my very own homegrown herbs. Before all of this mess, I had just given birth to my first baby, Celeste. So I had to put my massage business on the back burner. I am pagan, and if you don't know what that means, I'm into white magic, herbs, crystals. Remember how I said some might refer to Cranesville as weird? Well, before the explosion, my mom and I might have been the reason people thought that. You'd think witches would have been more accepted in the 21st century. Before the explosion, I could have sworn up and down that I was doing everything right. Wearing crystals, saging the house once a week, making protection jars, and writing sigils. I wanted to make sure I gave my baby the best life possible. I was fully prepared. Or at least I thought I was. The past four years have been horrible. But let me be clear. I deserved every bit of it. I was a mechanical engineer for the railroad before I became homeless, and I was good at that job. I was one of the bright prospects just out of college at 22. One of the best things about it was that I got to work here in my hometown, Cranesville. Eight years later after the train accident and the court hearings that followed, I became homeless in my hometown. I lost my job, my house, the love of my life, everything. After that, I just lived out on the streets. My job had been my life, my purpose, and losing it nearly destroyed me. I begged them to keep me on and promised to make up for my mistakes, but of course, they couldn't. I was a liability. I had failed the company, caused a huge loss of revenue, and worst of all, there had been two casualties in the accident. There wasn't a day that went by that I didn't think about it. I went into hiding in my own hometown. I hid myself. I hid my face. I was afraid that they might recognize me, the person responsible for that horrible accident. I accepted a life of isolation, out of sight, out of mind. For the two years that followed, the only company I had was nature. I listened to the birds sing and watched butterflies. I let myself be distracted by curious honeybees and petted friendly dogs that would wander up to me. It was terribly, terribly lonely. Everything became hard. It was so hot in the summer and so cold in the winter. Finding food was a full-time endeavor. Just finding shelter to sleep or getting out of the rain was a constant major task. Nature was hard, but nature accepted me, broken as I was. Nature didn't care. It didn't judge. It just accepted me. Even though I couldn't accept myself. I run the local shelter, Cranesville Animal Rescue. I would go to work at 5 in the morning, work until 6 in the evening, and head out. 
I might go out to the back roads and look for strays, or I'd drop by holidays, the jazz bar, chat, have a drink. I would talk with Stacy, the bartender there, about anything and everything. Mostly, I talked about my daughter, Stephanie. Stephanie's away for school in the city, and I worry about her. She's not around for me to care for, so I pour my extra caring into the animals at the shelter. I encouraged Steph to go because she was so fond of their business program. Since she left, she's been worried about me being alone, but I kept telling her, I'm okay. Everything's fine. But that all changed pretty quick. Back in Chicago, I live in this beautiful south-facing apartment in the heart of the city. Stunning brownstone walk-up. Uh, my husband, uh, ex-husband, and I used to go out almost every night. He used to bring me out of my shell. He was the, uh, social one. But I'm doing fine now, after the split. We didn't have any kids or pets, so that made things easier. Anyway, things have been good since we separated. He moved out, and I've just been focusing on work and myself. I feel, uh, freer. Did I give you one of my cards? Uh, my name is on there, Margaret Connolly. I, I'm a very established real estate agent in Chicago, one of the top in the company, <laughs> rivaled only by this brat, Mason. He's some 30-year-old hipster from uh, California. <laughs> thinks he owns the world. <laughs> you know what you need in this business, Mason? You need to care. Of course, wit and experience don't hurt, uh, and uh, he lacks both. I've come back to Cranesville to take care of my mother. She's gotten a little frail as she's gotten older, so she needs more help around the house. She had a fall recently that really scared her and my sister Leah. My sister practically begged me to come check on her, but I was like, there's doctors, even in a tiny town like that. She'll be fine. My sister can be insistent, so here I am. I mean, if you care so much about her, Leah, why don't you come check on her yourself? It's definitely weird being back here in Cranesville. 16 years, nothing has changed. That day was pretty normal. I woke up around 10 a.m., made mom and I breakfast. Uh, mom read stuff from the newspaper to me, but I was busy with emails for work. I talked to my coworker, Miranda, over the phone. She and her husband just got pregnant. She's super excited, uh, you know, checking all those little life boxes. I'm uh, happy for her. After dinner, I helped mom shower and put her to bed. Uh, I stayed up to go over more work. It's hard to get anything done while my mom is awake. She needs a lot of help lately. <laughs> Honestly, I was browsing flights back to Chicago between answering emails. I must have fallen asleep at the laptop. I, I woke up to this loud noise, like a bunch of uh, cannons. It was loud. The ground shook. Everything stopped after a couple minutes. I looked out the window, but there was no way I was going out there. No way. Well, my name is Bartholomew Truman, but most folks around here just call me Truman. Some years back, I served in the military for a short while, doing my best to serve our great country. Now I'm one of the local ranches in the area. I run the ranch near the edge of town. Got about 90 acres. My wife, Kat, short for Catherine, and I usually spend most of our time tending to our animals for a while. Personally, I like to start early in the day as to avoid most of the heat. And I typically head to the shed to work on some woodworking projects. I'm starting to get the hang of making chairs, if I may say so. It is just Kat and me out here along with all the animals, of course. Some days we head into town to the feed store. We usually make a thing out of it and like to get all fancy and take Kat out to dinner for a night. I think she looks forward to these date nights. It's a perfect excuse to wear some of the fancier clothing I own, too. You know, just last week we celebrated our 36th anniversary together. I was so late for work. I work at the library. My car started sounding funny. I thought, Lord have mercy, just get me there. 
I need a new car, but I'm not sure how I can pull that off. Maybe I should get a used 1997 Toyota, or even a Nissan next. Anyway, I was running late that morning, and the whole day went like that. I felt like I was in a rush from the moment I left the house that morning. <laughs> you would think working at the library is relaxing, but there's just this constant low-level arm of activity that lasts all day. In fact, I never really felt I had time for anything except work. I always used to want more time to read some of the books I was in charge of. I always wish I had time for a lot of things. Honestly. As soon as my head hit the pillow that night, I was out. I remember my cap kept crawling on my face. I opened my eyes. It was early morning. Through my front window, I could see this fuggish looking mist outside my house. I thought, what is this? Honestly, for a moment, I thought I was dreaming. Before everything, all that mattered was crossing out the bullet points in my to-do list. My several to-do lists. If I'm being honest, it was a system of major goals and sequential subset. Sorry, never mind. My entire life plan was dependent on being valedictorian. I needed to be valedictorian in order to go to a good school, in order to get a great job to eventually hold some kind of office and make some actual change. And that clearly was not happening in Cranesville. Not for lack of trying, of course. I think if the people at City Hall hadn't heard from me for two weeks, my face would have been lovingly recreated on every milk carton in the county. I had at least a few things in the works in the weeks leading up to the 16th. A petition to install stop signs on Center Street and restrict the Cranesville armadillo population from extinction. A proposal to replace the Cranesville High Dog Cat mascot before the following football season, complete with a mood board of non-horrifying mascots for reference and at least several thousand words to write and applications to every top-ranking political science school in the country. Once I was able to get final rankings from the admin ladies, that list also included writing an Oscar-worthy speech for a class of 57, and a believable apology to the probable salutatorian, Stacy. I just got done sending my highlight reel to about nine colleges. It turned heads. I'm an offensive lineman, center. I played for a community college south of here, but I had my eyes on the pros. I only sent my reel to the schools I had a shot at, and by that I mean schools that were in need of a better center. <laughs> a year at a big school, then on to the pros. I want to be the reason Cranesville got on the map. Am I talking about myself too much? You know, some dude at the gym the day before the blast tried to tell me I'm selfish just because I wouldn't let him use my weights between sets. He had the nerve to say he needed to get in one more set and that I'm self-centered for not wanting him to get his sweat all over the bench. So we argued, ruined my whole lift. I just walked out and I decided right then, I'm going to buy a dog. How could I be self-centered if I was taking care of an animal? That'll show that punk. But yeah. I was just trying to pass classes that semester. Like, what do I need with math and English? I already speak English, and I know my numbers. Why'd they have to combine them together to make algebra? It started as a normal day. Every day does. I wake up around four in the morning, throw my hair up, and head to the diner. My parents complain that I'm never at home anymore, and I'm starting to see their point. I say hello to Greg and Amanda, the owners, and I get down to business. There's always someone at the diner. Cranesville may be the tiniest, most unassuming, boringest town I've ever had the pleasure of living in. It's the only town I've lived in, but we get a decent amount of people passing through to grab some of the best scrambled eggs this side of Texas. I love the diner, I really do. The whole culture of the place. I've been working here since I was a sophomore in high school, which was around the same time that I was starting to realize that I don't want to live here for the rest of my life. Working here made me realize how much I genuinely enjoy restaurant work. I've begun taking a real interest in the kitchen side of things as well, like cooking. For the past few years, I've been saving up to get out of here and make my way to culinary school. I've applied to some of my top choices, and I've heard back from a few, but I'm still waiting to hear from my dream school. I have a basic savings goal set, and with a few scholarships lined up, I should be all set in the next four months. It's weird to think what life will be like then. The diner's been my home for quite a while, and while it'll certainly be weird to leave, I 
can't wait. I want to do something with my life. Maybe open my own restaurant someday. The world is just so big, and I just can't see myself as a waitress in Cranesville forever. Before the explosion happened, I think I had a pretty good life, but I wasn't exactly living my dream. I mean, at 21, you're supposed to live life, have fun, break the rules, know what you want, and just go for it. But honestly, I didn't know myself at all. I had times when I would be depressed because I felt like I couldn't achieve anything. I always lacked confidence. I think it started in elementary school. My mom noticed that I learned differently from others. And eventually, we found out I had dyslexia. When the kids would laugh at me, it made me feel like I was less. I struggled all throughout school, and I still have my moments of doubt. But the one thing I never doubted is that I love my family like no other. Most of the women in my family are nurses. My mom was a nurse, my grandmother too, before she retired. It's practically a tradition. I just knew I wanted to go to nursing school. I mean, it was my dream to help save lives. I was willing to do anything, and I mean absolutely anything to pay for it, even if it meant working at the Cranesville field stop out on the interstate. Prior to the explosion, I felt free to go through life as I saw fit. I remember being able to do whatever I wanted and feeling no sense of responsibility or connection to anyone else. My 9 to 5 job was just something I did to pay the bills. Most of the time, I didn't really like working with the old folks of the nursing home. I cared for their needs, sure, but I had no real attachment. If I'm being honest, I probably felt that way as a result of my divorce. It had been rough, and I had never really recovered. All those years that my wife and I were together seemed like one big lie. It took me until the crumbling end of my marriage to realize that her heart was never really in it, and that she never really loved me after all. I realized that I could never allow myself to go through something like that again. So staying disconnected from other people seemed like the safest thing to do. I lived alone with my fish, Steve, and I thought that was enough for me. I graduated from Cranesville High last year and I wanted to start college during the fall, so I was working full time. I also took care of my younger brother and sister. My day would usually start around 6 a.m. and end at 10 p.m. After I'd shower and make breakfast, I'd get the little ones up and ready. Then we would eat and I would drop them off at school. My dad was never in the picture and my mom liked to party a lot so she was never really around. It was hard for me. Basically, I was the mom. After I dropped the kids off at school, I'd go to the gym, then run errands or go home to clean. I'd pick up the kids after school and take them with me to work at the daycare. After work, we'd go home, I'd make dinner, clean some more, help the kids with homework, and put them to bed. Then I could finally breathe a little. I'd take a long bath and try to get some sleep and do it all again. It was exhausting. That Friday, I was sitting at my desk in math class, looking outside the window, waiting for Daddy to pick me up. I had a doctor's appointment, so I got to leave early. That was the appointment when I was told about my diabetes. Since Daddy was a doctor too, anything I didn't understand, he explained to me. It was really scary. The doctor said I couldn't eat candy or anything sweet for a while, and that I had to take some medicine every day. To cheer me up, Daddy took me to the library, and we had a picnic at the park while we read. <laughs> and then, when we got home, we watched Halloween. It was awesome! I know that sounds weird, but I love scary movies. Daddy does too. It was exactly what we needed after a hard day. I took my first shot of insulin that night. The night of the explosion, it hurt so much. But Daddy stayed with me until I passed out. It's funny how sleepy you can get from crying. <laughs> Before I went into work that night, I woke up around 3 p.m. I was queasy and my heart was heavy. I wanted my dad. The only line of communication we had was through the money he left me when he died. He left my bitter old mother behind too. 
She crossed my mind whenever I thought about him, but I couldn't call her. She lived a few towns over. I actively pushed her out of my mind. I usually hit the gym for about an hour or two and then find something to eat before getting dressed for work. I really didn't have any energy for the gym, so I stayed home and ordered a pizza. But when it came, the smell made me absolutely sick. It was really strange. But anyway, I ended up just eating a few peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. I was ready for work earlier than usual. I run holidays. It's a jazz bar representing the classier side of Cranesville, just like Daddy taught me. I wanted to cry. My emotions were everywhere thinking about him. But I made it to work, greeted Sandra at the door. She runs the animal shelter. The band arrived shortly after, and it was looking to be a typical night. I always thought my life was normal. I went to school, I graduated, I got married. My husband, Jeremy, was a dentist, constantly at work, but hey, it kept us comfortable. I didn't realize that he would push me to the back burner once we got married. He used to be so much more... warm. I felt like I wasn't all that important until I had my kids. My sweet little boy, Bentley, who's five, and my precious baby girl, Braylon, who just turned three. When they look at me, all they see is superhero mommy. I'm number one to them. And that's what gave me the confidence to start my blog. I never intended for it to become so popular. I just wanted to document my kids' childhood, the everyday moments, and the special moments. But it somehow evolved into an advice blog on raising kids. It was... a lot of work. All the editing and writing, any spare time I had, it went into the blog. It was draining, but overall it was good. To feel wanted and supported, it was certainly more than I got from Jeremy. Though the citizens of the town didn't know it at the time, the lockdown of Cranesville would last four long weeks. Even though the strange green mist that had leaked from beneath the blast site after the initial explosion was soon contained, the townspeople were told to stay in and around their own homes. Though some may have asked questions, no answers were forthcoming. The lockdown and the mysterious presence of what was presumed to be a governmental agency were ever present in the minds and hearts of the people of Cranesville. Periodically, groups of plain uniformed troops would be seen around the city, viewed through front windows or glimpsed at the far end of a neighborhood street. Plain cardboard boxes of basic food and supplies were delivered every five or six days, set on the front porches of every house in town. These supplies always appeared at odd hours, and no one reported ever witnessing the boxes being dropped off. While the hum of activity continued around the blast site itself, the community of Cranesville settled into an uneasy waiting game. Some took the lockdown in stride, recovering from the initial shock of the factory explosion and settling into a tentative new normal. Others, however, suffered from both the situation, the uncertainty, and the weeks-long sense of isolation. The story of a blast in Cranesville, told by the people who lived through it, continues. I woke up to a loud bang and headed for the truck. I tried to get the sirens going, but it was like they were shut off. My dad kid rang down and yelled at me, calm down, it's above our pay grade. Come on, we're, we're going to my house. On the way there, I could see a weird mist as we passed under the streetlights. I immediately had questions to ask, but my dad had no answers. I felt like he thought I was somehow overreacting. To me, he seemed suspiciously calm for what was going on. Once we got home, I retreated to my old room and dove into the internet to see if there was any explanation. Nothing. So I decided to set up a Twitter feed where people could post their theories. I told everyone in the group that my dad had to know what was going on. It, it was the only explanation for his calm mood. They all decided I should keep an eye on him. So I did for several days. His smug attitude, as if everything was going to be okay, sickened me. It got worse the more I thought about it. 
and I couldn't stop thinking about it. I guess it got to the point where I couldn't take the stress. I decided to confront him. One night after he fell asleep, I went into his room and grabbed him. I just meant to wake him up, but I found myself holding him down. I remember yelling at him that I, I knew something was up. I, I knew he was hiding something. He acted as though he had no idea what I was talking about. I pressed him harder and I slapped him. I, I yelled at him to explain what was going on. He began to panic. I slapped him again and he burst into tears. I looked at him and realized what was going on. I immediately backed off and broke into tears myself. I explained my thought process and asked for forgiveness. He confided that he was scared too, but when he saw me spiraling downward, he wanted to make sure I felt safe. It was the first time I had ever heard my dad admit his feelings and, and it opened my eyes to everything. He gave me a hug and it felt just like when I was younger. For the rest of the night, we sat and talked about how we had drifted apart after my mother had died and how he knew I was only in Cranesville because I wanted to please him. He told me that he was proud of me and that's how I knew that I couldn't leave. I felt like I had a real dad for the first time in forever. I was there the morning of the explosion. Uh, well, not when it happened, but right after. I ran out in my robe and pajamas, saw other curious folks stepping out too. Probably the most effective wake-up call any of us ever got. I drove to the site and was met with, uh, soldiers, I guess. They had uniforms, plain and drab. The factory was just rubble. You couldn't even tell it had been a factory. And then the... smoke? There was a green haze spreading out from the factory. It was this sort of waist-high mist. What was happening? Before I knew it, there was this tall fellow in a plain dark suit wearing dark sunglasses in front of me. Now, it's not quite sunrise. Anyone wearing sunglasses before the sun is fully up is probably a... I, 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 I don't know, a, a communist spy. It's just not American. I explained... I was the mayor, and demanded to know what was happening. And he looked at me, and behind those sunglasses, I felt a cold stare. And he told me to go home, said the town was under lockdown until further notice. That's it. He said nothing more. What was happening? That morning, I, I sent a mass text out to everyone in Cranesville, relaying what that man had said. I, I never needed to send out a citywide message before. So I wasn't sure if anyone knew it was the mayor texting them. Hopefully people didn't feel alarmed. <clears throat> that first week, things didn't seem so bad. I never ran out of work. Even under the lockdown, a, a city has to operate. <laughs> I worked from my home office. That green mist lingered for a few days. It made the town look like a ghostly sea. But eventually it was gone. <laughs> Sundays are, uh, <laughs> when I go around picking up litter. But because of restrictions, uh, I had to improvise, innovate. I watched for the drab uniformed men who delivered supplies weekly. I, I never saw them actually drop off the supplies, but I'd stand outside watching. I wanted to remind them to properly dispose of their garbage. Lockdown or not, this is our city. There was a, a plastic bag in the street. And I fashioned a, um, uh, a litter grabber out of those signposts that you'd see on campaign signs. I, uh, <laughs> I had plenty of campaign signs. Speaking of campaigning, I got the jump on campaigning for re-election during that time. Sure, the polls were months away, but you gotta get those things rolling or you lose out. I staked the sign in my yard, but I wasn't sure who was going to see it, aside from... The suits and the lab coats and the drab uniforms that rolled through periodically. Though, between you and me, I'm fairly certain they weren't residents of Cranesville. The night the factory exploded, I was having a terrible time falling asleep. My daughter was fussy, and by the time I dozed off, I had been up five or six times already. I should have noticed that the energy in the universe was off. 
but I was too tired to care. I remember waking up and thinking, what was that? Oh my God, the baby. She started crying almost instantaneously. As a new mother, I never would have imagined being in this situation, but I immediately ran to her and told her, it's gonna be okay, mama is right here. I will protect you. It's what my mom always said to make me feel better. I was so worried, but I needed to be strong for Celeste. Around sunrise, she fell back asleep, and that was when I looked outside and saw this green fog hovering over the ground. I immediately grabbed my phone and called my mom. My mom taught me everything I know about being pagan, from crystal energy to spells and sigils. I was sure she could help me keep everything safe, but it wasn't enough. I noticed my herb garden starting to wilt. I brought it inside and tried to heal it using crystals and moon water, but I couldn't save it. I thought that was as out of control as it could get, but then Celeste got sick. Her fever was high and her little body was shivering. My crystals didn't save my garden, so I had no herbs to heal Celeste. I turned to what I had left, sigils. I started drawing protection symbols all over sticky notes. I put them everywhere. Several days passed. Celeste was still sick. My baby was suffering. And I started to feel like maybe my mom and I were wrong about what all paganism could do. It was terrifying when the explosion happened. I was just outside of town sleeping in a meadow when I heard this deafening boom like a reverberating thunderclap. I'm sure everyone could hear it for miles. I woke up confused and, and scared, wondering what on earth was happening. I stayed put until the sun came up, then headed out to find the source of the commotion. I was several miles away from the factory when I saw this mist starting to expand from the blast zone, and I began to panic. For one thing, it was green, which made me assume it might be toxic. At that moment, though, it dawned on me that I had nowhere to go. If I had stayed out here and the mist kept expanding, what would happen? I didn't have a place to go. What was I supposed to do? I had to find shelter, so I ran into town. I could ask someone if I could stay with them, sneak into a shed, or break into a convenience store. Ultimately, I decided to go to the church. It was the simplest option, and for the most part, I didn't think I would run into anyone who knew me there. I entered through the back door and went into the room where they held the sermons, where I sat in a corner to process what I had seen. After a while, I fell asleep, and when I came to, there was this man in a green cardigan. He looked like he was in his mid to late forties, standing over me. He asked me why I was there. I just sat there. I was frozen in place. After a minute, he looked me over and said, If you need a place to stay, you can stay here. I take care of the place so there will be no problems, and you look like you could use a break. He told me about the lockdown of the town and that it was going to remain that way for the foreseeable future. During the next few weeks, the man never asked my name and I never asked for his. We spent a lot of time sharing stories about when life was normal, we even shared theories as to what the mist was. We had quite a few laughs on that topic. It was nice to finally be able to speak to another human being, have food to eat, and a consistent place to lay my head. I helped out around the church as best I could. Eventually, I told the man in the cardigan about how I ended up on the streets. Afterwards, he was quiet. Then he looked at me and said, Well, you're a smart young man and you still have so much to offer the world. He went on. The consequences of our actions are the results of the decisions we make. Regardless of whether they are good or bad, they are our consequences. We carry them in our hearts. It is a disservice to those who are no longer with us to not take responsibility for those consequences. We must face up to ourselves. As long as we have something, anything, to still offer the world. We must give it over. In the middle of the night, there was a booming noise and my bed shook. I got up and went over to my kitchen window, which was broken 
by the blast, and I saw smoke way out on the edge of town. I couldn't sleep after that. I walked to work like I always did, and there was this green mist on the ground. I had never seen anything like it. Definitely not in Cranesville at stupid early in the morning. I was terrified of what it might be, but I wasn't going to leave my animals by themselves. So I hiked my shirt collar up around my nose, and I made it. The animals were fine. Thankfully, the mist hadn't gotten into the building. Not that I could tell, anyway. Sometime around 8 or 9, me and my staff got a text saying that the town was under lockdown and that everyone had to go home. All of a sudden, these people, what looked like three men in bright yellow hazmat suits, came in. They yelled at us to get out and that the shelter was closed. They wouldn't say anything else. Over the next few weeks, with the shelter closed, all I did was worry. I developed some really bad anxiety. I worried about the animals, money, and I worried about Stephanie worrying about me. I ended up sneaking into the shelter a handful of times to check on the animals. They weren't being fed properly, and it was filthy in there. It was cruel. I had to sleep at the shelter for a few nights to get things back on track, but about two and a half weeks in, I got caught. The hazmat said they knew I'd been sneaking in and out, and I said, how? Because the animals are actually being fed? I told them I owned the building and I could live there if I wanted to, and I wasn't going to let the animals starve. That's when one of the hazmats got really close and said, Miss Brody, I think it'd be best if you go home and stay home. I have no idea how they knew my name. That scared me. But I snuck back one more time and left out as much food and water as I possibly could. I didn't know what else to do. So, for the rest of lockdown, I stayed inside and kept worrying about everything, especially money. With the shelter closed, I had no income and neither did my employees. Stephanie sent money from her part-time job, but I couldn't help but feel bad for everyone else. <sighs> the worst part was having no facts, none. You spend a month tied up, and you can't help but wonder why. I couldn't sleep after the explosion. As soon as the sun came up, I, I, I could see that there was this fog. Green fog, uh, like a Ghostbusters movie. I, I got a text saying to stay inside until further notice, and this demand was going to be enforced. So now I was trapped here, without knowing when I could get back to Chicago, back to work. Uh, being stuck with mom all day. Every day was compounded by calls from the home office. Uh, my boss was on my case asking where I am and when I'm coming back. I, I didn't know what to tell her at first. Uh, just said something came up at home, but I was missing appointments, losing commissions, and having to arrange for other agents to take them. I, I was worried I wasn't going to have a job when I got back. Meanwhile, mom can't remember where she put the remote. And I was so just <sighs> stressed. The next time my boss called, something came over me. I, I told her where I was. And then I I just started spitballing. I, I was thinking, Cranesville is a small town. We could get some development going. Parks, condos, uh, and apartments, nicer houses. I don't know anything about land development, but my boss has connections. You want to know the top selling point? A centuries-old factory exploded and the place was covered for days in a mysterious, radioactive-looking fog. <laughs> we could make this place the next Roswell, just without all the meth. Uh, my boss seemed super excited. I, I don't know what came over me. I just created. In the middle of this pressure cooker situation, I made a whole new opportunity for myself. Mom was really happy that she announced she was going to make us lunch that day. Oh, over the last few weeks, she's been so dependent on me. Honestly, it was nice for her to do something. After a little bit of time, I smelled something burning. Mom had left a pan on as she was at the sink, and there was a pot overflowing with water, and she was just standing there. She was just staring. Staring straight ahead. Then, just like that, Mom snapped back to reality. She seemed shaken a bit, but then got back to making lunch. I didn't leave the kitchen again until lunch was ready. Called my sister. Realized why she wanted me home so bad. Mom has Alzheimer's. It was diagnosed last year. 
Why wouldn't they tell me that? This is how I find out? Let me tell you about our most colorful horse. We call her Sheep. All of our animals are named after other animals. So, Sheep walked right on up to me and decided that my beard wasn't to her liking too much and decided to start chewing on it like it was a Sunday brunch and everything. I had to wrestle her off my face and right when I was finally getting her back to the stables, I started to notice this odd looking mist start to rise up around us. Now, fog isn't usually an odd occurrence in these parts, especially in the morning and especially around the pond on our property. But when I saw the greenness, I thought to myself, Well, sugar honey, I see you. That is not something you see every day. I got sheep back in the stables and tried my best to make sure all the other animals were accounted for and safe before heading back inside to talk with Cat about what I saw. She didn't seem to give it too much thought at first, but then Cat had mentioned that she had woken up earlier than usual to some kind of loud sound coming from the edge of town or something. I believe she said it was close to three in the morning. She was surprised I had managed to sleep through the noise, but let me tell you, living on a farm and having served in the military teaches you to pay attention to the important noises. So if I didn't wake up, it couldn't have been all that important, right? Apparently, all the commotion was from the factory in town. It got so bad that the whole area was actually put under lockdown. Can you believe it? Lasted for weeks. Ah, well, it didn't bother me all too much. Life on a farm is pretty routine. The days don't change so much as the seasons. But Cat took it a bit harder than I was expecting. Enough that I started to kind of worry about her. Worry about us. I got an anonymous text message saying all cranes we residents must stay in or return to their residency immediately. The whole time was on lockdown and I thought, what luck what? I thought my life was already boring with nobody around me, but now I was going to have to stay in my house with my own self, well, with my cat. It wasn't all just like that. I'm a widow. My judge passed away three years ago. My boy Gerald just left college. Both of us took it hard. Since he was a boy, he was always much closer to his father. After the funeral, we just drifted apart. You know what happens to people. I hadn't talked to him in nearly a year when the explosion happened. I didn't even have his new cell phone number. Can you believe that? I wish so much he was with me during the lockdown. The first week or two after it happened, I was checking every social in 20 minute intervals. There was no information that I could find. And I was following every local official within half an hour of Cranesville. Nothing. I even texted Mayor Aquino directly. I called town hall every day trying to do something, organize wellness checks or something. I was able to ramble into the voicemail once or twice and then it would ring for as long as I could stand it. One morning, it was just dead, and it stayed that way, until the lockdown was over. We were all so vulnerable. Everything we'd done in our lives, in this town, just didn't count. I couldn't think straight, much less finish an application. I could see from my window that the hole for the stop sign had been dug. The city had started acting on the petition the day before the explosion, and I thought I could cross it out the list. With everyone locked down, the roads were empty, so I guess it didn't matter. But the armadillos were still showing up, just slightly green. Each morning, I could see the tire treads that were big, like cargo truck big. I never saw any vehicles, never even heard. I, um, I wanted to sneak out in the night, try to get some answers, but I could barely get past the front door. All I could do was sit in the doorway and stare out into the dark. Outside it was just so wrong. The quiet was constant and charged, like there was a hum in everything that wasn't you. Maybe it was the fog. Maybe it had gotten to our heads, gotten to me. I can't shake the thought though that whatever I felt could feel me too. The quiet was present and looming. I could blare music and scream, vacuum the whole house, and it would still be so silent. A lockdown? Really? And for what? Some loud explosion? Yeah, I heard it. I was up, actually, and was just getting in. I went on a late-night jog with Billy. Oh, um, Billy is the Doberman I bought from the Cranesville Animal Shelter. Well, 
okay, let me start a little further back. That day, before the explosion happened, I went to the shelter to look at the dogs. The nice lady who runs the place showed me this cuddly looking Doberman. I saw this fellow waiting for me, just staring at me. I knew I had to get this dog. I named him Billy, because he really looks like a Billy. For real. Guess I wasn't really all that prepared. On my way home, I kept turning around to get something else I forgot. Food, bowls, toys. I found out real quick owning a dog is hard, but Billy grew on me. We got our first run in together that evening. Later that night, I heard that loud bang. I figured the police would handle it, so I went straight to sleep. After that, man, everything got even worse. I woke up to some cryptic text and I ignored it. Then when I was ready to go to the gym, I saw some green mist all over the ground. Then I got a text from the school saying all classes were canceled and this semester would be annulled. I didn't know what that meant, but I knew I had to get my homework in ASAP. I was staying inside anyways, so I spent the whole day on homework. I started to understand it a bit, but I was just glad to get it over with. I'm not going to lie, I was feeling pretty smart after doing all that, so I decided to look up what annulled meant. Then I felt stupid. I've always hated feeling stupid, so I tried my hardest to smarten up by reading the dictionary or doing calisthenics. I heard they're good for studying, and I had to do calisthenics because apparently we were all supposed to stay home. That just made me mad, and I felt like I had to get out. I went outside and still saw the mist, probably the reason for the lockdown, but that wouldn't stop me. I pulled my shirt over my face just in case, and I left Billy in the bathroom. I sprinted to the gym. The doors were locked. Man, I had a breakdown from the sprinting and the anger and the whole situation, and eventually I was spotted and escorted back home by the people in charge. How could they close the gym? How could they do that to me? Me! That gym was my home! Anyway, I had no choice but to channel that anger into working out at home. Couldn't risk losing this body over some lockdown. After a couple days, the mist cleared and I could finally go into the backyard with Billy. It was good. We both got some cardio in. I thought I would be able to leave once the mist cleared, but the guards or whatever let me know real quick that was a definite no. They were punks. I woke up at my usual time to go to work only to find that I couldn't. No one could go anywhere. All of a sudden, literally overnight, there's a sci-fi movie green mist covering the town and a government-ordered lockdown. I thought, I'm trying to get out of this town, not get stuck in it. <sighs> it took a while for me to adjust, to say the least. It ended up being just a month, but it felt like an eternity. I haven't been at home for more than enough time to eat dinner and go to bed in... I don't even remember how long. I spent all of my time at that diner. Being confined in my house with nothing to do is my own personal nightmare. My grandma always told me that I had this drive, but it felt like the road had suddenly given out ahead and there was no way to get past. I had absolutely no idea what to do with all of this new free time. I'm always up on my feet, moving around. Sitting and doing nothing isn't the way I work. I tried watching TV, something I'd never get to do, but it got really boring really fast. Sitting still isn't fun. I couldn't even go on a walk around the block because we were confined to our property for some reason. I also used to rarely see my parents, and now I suddenly had to be around them for four whole weeks. They did appreciate the breakfast, though, and after the second week of supplies was delivered, I decided to see what I could make out of lockdown food. I ended up coming up with some wacky recipes, and thankfully mom and dad were happy to be my test subjects. Most of it was really good, but I learned that box cake mix doesn't work in much else besides cakes and cobblers. Despite all the fun I was having in my home kitchen, it just wasn't the same as the diner. Mom and Dad are great, but serving them just isn't the same as serving for my regulars. The house was the house. I wanted to be home at the diner. The overnight shift at the fuel stop is usually pretty slow. I was about halfway through my shift when I heard a loud BOOM! I was terrified. I felt nauseous. I had never been so afraid. I was shaking, crying, and super confused. I called my mom to check on her and my sister. She answered and told me she was okay, but my sister was not. I was so worried, I couldn't even think straight. So I took off for home as fast as I could. When I arrived, I found that my sister had suffered severe cuts on her arm from a window that had shattered during the explosion. This was a problem because my sister has hemophilia. 
My mother being a nurse was able to finally stop the bleeding and wrap her arm. Everything initially seemed okay, but every time the bandages had to be changed, my sister's bleeding became a problem. One time, she even passed out. As the lockdown continued, I saw my mother's exhaustion and stress continue to increase. I could see she felt stuck with what was on hand here at home. My sister needed more advanced help. I wanted to help relieve some of her burden, but I was afraid. I felt like a bystander in my own house. One night, as my mother was asleep, I heard my sister crying. Her bandages were soiled and she was in pain, but she knew the risk of removing the bandages. I started to wake my mother, but then I noticed how tired and frail she looked. I became so angry with myself. I summoned my courage and sat down gently next to my sister. I tried remembering how my mother had carefully cleaned the wounds and changed the bandages, then started to work. I worked slowly and methodically, all the while speaking in a soothing manner to my sister. I put the new bandages on and her bleeding stopped within minutes. She laid down to rest and it made me feel good to see my sister sleep peacefully. It also made me feel good about myself that I had summoned the courage to be of real help. It made me think about working at the fuel stop and if it was worth working for minimum wage. It was at that moment I knew I could make it in nursing school. After the explosion hit, I couldn't leave the house not even for work. I hoped someone was assigned to the nursing home. I'm sure someone was. For the last several years, most of my interactions had centered around my elderly patients. I had always thought I was the one helping them. That was my job. Until that point, I never understood that it was helping me to feel less isolated. Whatever I had felt before, now I felt truly alone. I started to realize that it's not so easy to stay away from people. I miss being able to walk or bike around town whenever I wanted. The lockdown made that part of life impossible. A few days into it, I went out of my front yard and I saw bits of charred materials and fused glass scattered about. Items punctured through the trees in the area around me. Of everyone in town, I probably lived the closest to the old factory. The explosion blew the leaves off the trees in the area, all these little mounds of scorched leaves. The town around me resembled a barren wasteland. After days of isolation, I just started talking to my goldfish Steve. We had in-depth conversations on what it was like inside and outside of the fishbowl we were both living in. It was Steve who convinced me that I should talk to my next door neighbor, Gracie. Occasionally, I would see her walk outside, and whenever she spotted me, she was always kind and would give me a wave. Since I had moved into this place, I had yet to actually speak to her. I told my goldfish that he didn't know anything about women. Then I remembered, neither do I. Ultimately, I knew Steve was right. I made up my mind to talk to her, but I didn't know how to go about it. My divorce had been a disaster. I was shaky on the whole starting a relationship thing. The next morning, I saw her in her yard picking out debris. I stumbled up to my fence line and half muttered a hello. As she turned, her face lit up as she saw me. She said it would be about time that I finally spoke to her. We spent the next couple of hours just standing on either side of the fence from one another. It was the first genuine conversation I had had in years. We were flirting and talking about our past lives. We tried our best to keep our minds off the present. It was a little awkward at first, but we warmed up to one another. The vibe got more comfortable as time went by. I got the feeling she was just as lonely as I was. Over the next few weeks, we shared plants from our yards and began improving the looks of each other's property. We shared tools by passing them across the fence. We both had seeds for flowers and vegetables. She had heirloom irises and shared some of the tubers with me, explaining that I just needed to sprinkle some soil over them and they would bloom next spring. Just like the garden, our relationship started to grow. Then the explosion happened. I was hoping to sleep in a little, even if it was only an extra 30 minutes, but the blast woke us up. My mom wasn't home, I was so tired and focused on calming the kids down, I didn't think too much about what was actually going on. It's like there wasn't room in my head to process all of it. 
all I ever got was that text early in the morning that put us on lockdown. After that, my friends were blowing up my phone. Then when the sun came up, you could see that gross green stuff. <sighs> Things were really bad and we were on lockdown for a long time. My routine got messed up and I didn't know what to do or how to explain what was going on to my brother and sister. That's something a mom should do or a dad, but whatever, I mean, I didn't even know what was happening, so what could I tell them? Trying to keep the kids inside, the house was by far the hardest thing. They wanted to go play in that misty green stuff. I had to lie to the kids that it was all a game and we had to stay inside until the green stuff and the bad guys went away. I tried not to think about it too much, but I was worried about my mom. She had gone out the night before the explosion and then the lockdown meant everyone had to stay home or get home as soon as they could, but she didn't come back that morning. She never came back. No one was telling us anything and we couldn't exactly walk around to look for clues. After five days or so, my next door neighbor snuck over. She's an older, super nice lady, like 50 maybe. She lives alone. Her name is Sophia. She noticed my mom's car hadn't been in the driveway. Once I told her what I was dealing with, she insisted that we stay with her so she could help. And then, I'll never forget this, she gave me a huge hug and I cried so hard. I had bottled up everything and tried to stay strong for the rest of the family. I couldn't remember the last time anyone had hugged me. It felt good, but it also made me really sad. It's hard to explain. And Sophia's house is way nicer than ours, so it was sort of like we got to stay in a hotel. She kept saying, in times like this, we have to help each other. She was like a fairy godmother. I love glitter so much, and I was dreaming about swimming in a pool of glitter when the explosion woke me up. Daddy ran into my room and told me to get dressed. He seemed scared, so I was scared. We peeked outside and far away, we could see fire and smoke. Daddy got called in for work, I guess because they thought people would be hurt by the explosion. It was way too late for a babysitter, so I went with him to the hospital. He let me use the cot in his office and I fell right back asleep. But when I woke up, we were home. Daddy said he got a message that said we weren't allowed to stay at the hospital. After I had some breakfast, I looked out the window and it looked so cool. It reminded me of that movie, The Fog. <laughs> but since I didn't see any killer ghosts out there, I thought we were safe. I kind of thought the lockdown was fun, like I was in my own scary movie. But after a while, I got sick of it. I just wanted to go outside, go to the library. Daddy made phone calls every day, but he never found out what caused the explosion. He was worried for everybody in town because the hospital wasn't open to take care of people. And we were both afraid my insulin shots would run out. I felt bad for my dad. It seemed like he got more tired each day. <laughs> but at least we had cable and there were lots of movies for us to watch together. He did say he loved spending so much time with me, and I liked it too. We helped each other get through it. The bar was busy, but I love busy. The band hung out around the bar to say their goodbyes. I remember looking at my phone. It was maybe three in the morning, and I couldn't wait to fill my pillow. I went to flip the light switches, and I heard a noise from outside. I couldn't put a direction to it. It seemed to echo all around, and it made my heart drop. I didn't know what was happening, and honestly, I was too afraid to try to figure it out, so I hurried to the car. I didn't have the slightest idea what was going on, but my eyes wouldn't stay open to find out. The next day, I woke up with the worst stomach pains. I thought about going to the hospital, but it was closed. When I looked at my messages, I had one unread message from an unknown number. The message basically said that Cranesville was on lockdown until further notice. We couldn't leave our property. 
that made me feel even worse. I had a theory that the lockdown would last as long as that green mist, but it was gone in a few days. I guess the wind blew it away, but we still didn't have any answers and they didn't let us out of our houses either. Authorities occasionally made rounds in my neighborhood to make sure no one was on the streets. Once a week, whoever was in charge delivered stuff like toilet paper and canned food, but I never saw who dropped off the boxes. <laughs> the boxes just seemed to appear overnight. I had nothing else to do, so I took a few days to clean out and rearrange my shed. I found an old letter I'd written to my mother a while back when I was in counseling. I never sent it to her. I was trying to make sense of all my anger towards her and our misunderstandings. All that time alone, I just kept thinking about her, but I still couldn't bring myself to call her. I didn't know how long we would be controlled. I started to fear that the bar might have to close or I'd have to dig into my own account to pay bills for the month. The weirdest thing was, all of lockdown, I felt sick and had crazy mood swings. I didn't know if I was going crazy or what. I was desperate to see a doctor. After I put the kids to bed, I was ready to collapse myself. Never let someone tell you having two kids is a breeze. I slept great until about 3 a.m. At first, I thought Jeremy was shaking the bed to wake me up, but I knew something was wrong when pictures started falling off the walls and there was glass all over the floor. I mean, it was like a bomb went off. Somehow, Jeremy slept through it. I slapped him awake as I ran to check on the kids. Both of them were crying, shaking like leaves. I just grabbed them both, and as we were hurrying downstairs, I glanced out the window and I didn't understand. Everything looked calm. I wrapped the kids up in their favorite fluffy blankets and held them for a while. Once they weren't scared anymore, I took them back upstairs. It took a few Disney movies, but I eventually got them back to sleep. I kept thinking about how I put the memory into the blog. Ways to calm your kids during disasters seemed like a pretty good title. I stayed up, and around six, Jeremy turned on the news. But no one was talking about the noise. How on earth does the news not even mention it? We were both frustrated. In retrospect, I have to wonder, was the factory a ticking time bomb the whole time we've lived here? Later that morning, and for the whole next month, the town was put under lockdown by government order. A friend from across town sent me videos of military-style trucks driving towards the old factory on the outskirts of town. I used my blog to update my followers on the situation. In the beginning, it was therapeutic. People would ask questions, talk about how crazy it all was, and I would adamantly agree. They started to share their theories on what was really going on with the factory. And I got one post that really ate at me for a while. Some woman said, How could you keep your kids in town with all that going on? Don't you care about their safety? <laughs> if whatever it was, was truly dangerous, then home was the safest place for them to be, right? Jeremy agreed. If he didn't, I think I'd have filed for divorce. But he... he surprised me. He broke out board games. I can't remember the last time we had done something so normal, and without doing it for the kids' sake. One night, I forget when exactly, we had a long conversation about anything and everything. The lockdown, money, us. He kissed me in a way that made my heart skip a beat. <laughs> he told me how much he loved me, that he loved our family, and that we were going to be okay. I remember thinking, maybe things won't be so bad. It has been three months since the lockdown in Cranesville ended. For four long weeks, the citizens of this small community huddled in their homes, living in frustration, in anticipation, in confusion. Time moves in strange ways in small towns. Days blur into weeks, weeks into months, months into years. For the townspeople here, time seemed to stop. Four weeks after they had originally arrived, the lab-coded authorities left. 
They packed up their equipment, their hazmat suits, and their research tents, and in a procession of cargo trucks, rolled quietly out of town over the course of a single afternoon. They left not a trace that they had been there at all, not at the blast site of what was once the Crane Co. factory, and not on the town at large. They did, however, leave a stunned community thirsty for answers. Why had they come? Had they found what had caused the factory explosion? What was the strange green mist that emanated from the ground beneath the blast site? Had it been toxic? Had the town been at risk? Why the lockdown? So many questions with no answers. Citizens were informed via text that the lockdown had been lifted and just like that, they were left to pick up the pieces of their lives. Some in the town were set back in ways large and small, feeling that a month of their lives had been essentially stolen from them. Others coiled and tightened in the weeks of stay-at-home isolation, sprang back into the world, changed, altered by their experiences. This is the story of a blast in Cranesville, told by the people who lived through it. After the explosion, people were still very shocked and afraid of what was going on in town. I often think about how my father comforted me during the lockdown. I think about that night I attacked him. I decided I had to be a voice of reason in the town and let people know that they're not alone. My dad and I set up an emotional support group where people could meet and talk about what happened to them. Some people were originally scared to share, but after everyone heard what had happened between us in confinement, they became a bit more confident in sharing their experiences. Through this group, I've learned just how much I want to help people. I especially want to be of service to the people of Cranesville, those who were affected by the blast. I know how scary uncertainty can be. It's something we all live with now. Normal is truly gone for the people of this town. But we're all working towards a new normal that we can piece together with one another. Sometimes I think to myself, what caused the factory explosion? Who were the troops who rolled into town? Why the lockdown? Through all this, I still wonder what exactly happened. Maybe you will find out together someday. No one knew it was me that sent those stay at home and all clear texts. Seriously, no one seemed to know they had come from the office of the mayor. I, I suppose I don't know this town as well as I thought I did. During the lockdown, there were problems that I couldn't fix. That didn't look good, and it didn't feel so nice. That following month was filled with meetings. Some emotional. I'm sure there will be more. I, I think a few citizens are working on a petition to demand answers. There's just a, a lot of questions, a lot of confusion. The thing is, I, I don't know the answers. I, I'm not sure how I can help. For the first time as mayor, I've really got a good look at the people of this town. Maybe I was more concerned with Cranesville in the, uh, in the abstract, as an idea, as a dream. Maybe I didn't take time to really care enough about the town's people. I won't be seeking re-election. My parents are looking to retire. That means the farm will probably end up under my care. I'm still not agriculturally inclined, so I'm still mulling around what to do with the place. Say, maybe I'll turn it into a museum. A piece of Cranesville and its history, open to the public. Yeah, yeah. How, how's that for a legacy? The Cranesville Museum, with a plaque at the front door that says, Dedicated to the city and its citizens. Commissioned by Benedict Aquino, former mayor. Yeah, that, that's good PR, right? How's that sound? The lockdown was definitely something, huh? One thing I am thankful for is that Celeste only had a bad cold. 
Knowing I had no control to help my baby was so hard, but I'm just glad she's okay. I don't think the green fog did anything other than kill my herbs. Thankfully, I have been able to plant more and I think these might grow to be even better. Although I love those herbs, I realize there are more important things like my baby and her health. I think I learned a lot about being a mom during all of this. No matter how prepared you think you are, you're definitely not. The herbs and crystals may have given me a false sense of security. Maybe there are some things in the world that are too strong for magic. If I raise Celeste to be pagan, I want her to understand that magic can't fix everything. If she goes through life expecting to have control in every situation, she will be very stressed and disappointed. Just as my mom passed on her knowledge to me, I want to pass mine on to Celeste. The only difference is, is that I'm going to make sure Celeste knows that our magic doesn't guarantee any control in the universe. The lockdown ended quite abruptly. They sent a brief message to everyone that it was being lifted. It was random, and they didn't give any explanations. Honestly, I want to know what it was all about. But that isn't the most pressing matter at hand. I was offered a place to stay at the church, even after the lockdown, in exchange for helping with the upkeep. As I'm doing my chores, I often think about those words the man in the green cardigan said to me all those weeks ago. I couldn't forgive myself for what I'd done. I still can't. Not fully. But what I do is use my skills to better the lives of others. Now that I am finally starting to get my feet under me, I have allowed myself to contemplate the future. I want to shift into other fields, especially environmental engineering. I want to achieve new goals. I've decided to get myself straightened out, become more presentable. I'm currently filling out applications to work again, applying for jobs in neighboring cities. I know it won't be easy, but I feel for the first time in a long time as though there's now at least a little glimmer of hope. The authorities just up and left one day. No explanation, no notice. Stephanie dropped everything and came to see me. She drove back from school the day after the lockdown lifted. She had to pass by the old factory when she came into town. She said she didn't see it on her way in. Like it was never there, it was just gone. When Steph got to my apartment, she hugged me like she thought I'd died. I think it reminded me I hadn't. I cried the hardest I've cried in a long time. I still cry every now and then, and I'm not really sure why. Leftover anxiety, post-traumatic stress, I don't know. I went out looking for strays and I found so many. Most of them were alive if scared and hungry, but a handful weren't so lucky. The dead ones didn't look dehydrated or starved, so my guess is it was the green mist that did it. There's no way to really know, and that really messes with me. I guess one good thing is, after the lockdown, a lot more people came in to adopt. I guess no one wants to be alone. I even got myself a senior cat. I named him Mr. Jefferson, because I thought that'd be funny. Stephanie didn't get it. After the lockdown was lifted, I wasn't sure what to do with mom's diagnosis. It felt wrong leaving her. That whole incident in the kitchen, it wasn't safe for her to be alone. I also didn't want to lose my job. I've spent 20 years building myself a career and I can't think of starting over down here. And I don't want to retire yet. 
in the end, I decided to move down here at, at least for a little bit to figure things out and be close to mom in, in case she needs me. When I went back to Chicago to get the move started, I, I went by the office. The boss didn't seem interested in talking about work or the Cranesville development project. She just wanted to make sure I was okay and making the right choice. She was supportive. It did come up, however, that Mason might be taking over the development project since I was possibly leaving. Can you believe that? Mason? I made a whole new business opportunity for them, for my boss, and more importantly, for me. That was my opportunity. Now this little rat-faced chump comes in while I'm most vulnerable and tries to steal my project. I, I was so frustrated I couldn't be there anymore. I, I came back to Cranesville and focused on mom and, and trying to find another job. They hadn't fired me yet in Chicago, but I was not going to work for a company that doesn't respect me. Uh, about a week after getting back to Cranesville, my boss called. She apologized if they made me feel like chopped liver. Then, the best part. You want to know what happened? She put me back in charge of development. Said there was no one else she trusts to do it. And having me down here would make it all the more convenient. <laughs> Suck it, Mason. I have a lot to learn about managing a major project, but I've become good at adapting. Uh, Mom has been doing well, too, considering. It, it doesn't seem like the Alzheimer's is spreading too fast. The doctor said we'll have her around for a good while to come. I'm glad for it. I've missed her. Anyhow, I was glad the whole situation with the lockdown finally ended. You can only have so many days of a horse trying to eat your beard before you start to get tired of it, I'll have you know. The biggest sticking point during those four weeks was between me and Cat. We tried playing some board games that we had for when we had guests over, but you can only say sorry so many times before knocking those pieces back to the start before it all begins taking a toll. Stuck on the farm all day, every day we started to get on each other's nerves. A little at first, then a little more. It seemed to happen so quick. And there was no relief. We had no idea when this lockdown thing was going to blow over. The intensely quiet evenings of board games became intensely quiet evenings of us reading in separate corners, then in separate rooms. Heck, things got so bad we even had to find different beds to sleep in about halfway through the lockdown. We started behaving like those folks that dropped off the supplies on the front porch. The box was there, so there was evidence someone had been there. But you never saw whoever dropped those supplies off. I never realized just how much those weekly dates had meant to her. Just to get away from the farm. Away from the day to day. Just every four or five days. Just enough. Things are better now. As soon as those fellows rolled out of town and the lockdown lifted, we gussied up and hit holidays. A jazz cafe in town. One of Cat's favorites. And just like that, we were back again like we were. I guess it is the little things that are important, you know? It was a long lockdown for me. Actually, it had seemed like a long even after the lockdown ended. The library moved to an ebook checkout system for the extent of the lockdown, so that was a lot less stress for me in the mornings. In fact, not having to rush to get out of the door and hustle to work was really relaxing. I did some reading and tried some few set recipes I hadn't got around to before, gained some weight, my hair was never done. The cats, on the other hand, got brushed a lot. Not sure they appreciated that. At first, I did a lot of car shopping online. I still can't afford one, but that was a nice browse. I have a degree in library science, so researching things is not that hard for me. I guess I just never had the time or maybe the inclination to really decide to do it. But I tracked my son, they are, he lives just 30 miles away, I'm so glad I called him up, he came over the other day, we now talk every other day, he's back in my life, I guess the whole thing wasn't bad after all. I wish I could say something meaningful, give some big revelation that came from all this. In truth, there is no conclusion, no grand finale. There's a strange sort of space between everything now. Like there was a history of ours that we decided to make room for. A history that will only ever exist for us. I have learned to take a little space for myself. 
Just a little. So, the stop signs are placed at the Armadillo Crossing, and our dog cat mascot, unfortunately, lives on. All 57 students graduated in the class of 19. I gave my speech as valedictorian. It didn't feel as important as I dreamed it would. I'm not sure anything can anymore. There's still that space here, lingering where normal once was. And I think it'll be okay. I'm going to be okay. I'm flying to study abroad, somewhere. It's scary, deciding when there are so many possibilities. I'll be okay, wherever it is, I think. Cranesville has given up normal for the strange and unknown. And frankly, I think we should all embrace that strangeness. Clearly, the world is much more interesting than we once thought. Maybe we can be too. So, all of that was like three months ago. Today is my birthday. I'm 21. And I think I'm having what's called an epiphany. That whole lockdown situation will definitely stick with me my entire life. I've enlarged my vocabulary enriched my muscles, and I took care of Billy the dog. I feel that I proved to myself that I am not selfish. That's an acknowledgement. But even though that whole situation was valuable to me, I'm glad it's over. Do I know what went on with the old factory? No. Do I know why we had to be locked down for so long after the mist was gone? No. I thought about joining one of those local support groups to help find some answers, but hey, this whole episode will give my future fans a mystery to solve about where I came from. SP was from Cranesville. Isn't that where that weird explosion happened? And hey, I got three offers for the fall. I decided to play in Oklahoma. One step closer to the pros. Hmm. I wonder if they allow pets on campus. I guess I didn't think about that. Huh. Billy and I will have to talk about it. Well, it's been a few months. I reached my savings goal last month, which was a lot sooner than expected, and I got accepted into my dream school. It's one of the top culinary schools in the country. I'm looking into apartments, and I hope to move out really soon. Oh, right, with the lockdown. Uh, it was stressful. Most people would probably find a month at home sort of relaxing, but not me. Okay, it was a little nice to slow down. I got a lot of practice in the kitchen. By the end of the lockdown, I was preparing every meal. I spent more time with my family in four weeks than I had in the previous four years. That's good, because I'm about to get up and leave Cranesville. Mom and Dad are really proud, and I know Grandma is too. I'll miss the diner, but I know I'll be back to visit from time to time. I'm off to learn my trade at culinary school, and I just survived a mysterious government order to lockdown. I still don't really know what happened or why we were forced to stay home, but it's all in the past now. My mind is now on the future. I think I've changed as a person. I finally gained the confidence that I had wished for, even if it did take an explosion to make that happen. I was so happy to be able to help my sister. In a roundabout way, the lockdown helped me find faith in myself. It helps me find faith in the Lord too. I know now that anything is possible. I live by my favorite Bible verse, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. I've saved almost of enough money for nursing school, and I plan to go next spring. It's a good feeling to know that my days at the fuel stop will soon be coming to an end. That explosion may have changed me, but it didn't change my goals. I'm going to shoot for the stars and be successful. With God on my side, anything is possible. I feel like things are improving daily. I am once again able to walk and bike the streets. The trees, yards, and flowers are coming back out. Birds have been singing. I saw mallards on the pond last week, so I will be bringing them bread soon. It turns out Gracie is a chess whiz, and she has been challenging me to a game several times a week. I'm confident that our relationship will continue. She made me realize that having people in your life is important. They help you out when you need it. I now understand how important my job is at the nursing home. My elderly patients need me. I had never thought about it before, but I have actually had some good times with them. It's nice to know that people, some people actually think I'm worth something. 
And as for Steve, even though I'm pretty sure a goldfish can't talk, I'd still like to think he can. And on that note, I want to reward him for being a good friend during the hard times. I plan to put a TV in front of his bowl, maybe show him some scenic videos to keep him entertained. <laughs> Everyone needs some connection to the outside world. When we finally got to leave our houses, it was weird at first because people were so used to staying at home, not doing anything, not talking to anyone else. It's still kind of like that. When you walk by someone you don't know, a lot of times they don't even look at you. It's getting better, but I still feel like things are different. Anyway, with the help of our neighbor Sophia, I'm leaving in the fall and I'll be the first person in my family to ever go to college. Sophia insisted on it. She said it would be a blessing to her to get to take care of my brother and sister while I was gone. And she'd help us figure everything out. I said she didn't have to, that it wasn't her responsibility. And she just said, I know, but Andrea, you deserve to focus on yourself now. She didn't say this, but I knew she had been lonely. Sometimes you get a feeling about someone and you know that person is an actual nice and caring human being. I noticed that about Sophia and I think she enjoyed the chance to finally act like a mom. She's really good at it too. My shots of insulin did run out a few days before the lockdown was over. I didn't know the whys and the hows of everything, and for a little bit, I felt too cold and weak to care about anything. But after the bad guys in lab coats and uniforms went away, and lockdown was over, my dad made sure I got my medicine, and I started feeling happy again. <laughs> And so did he. Things got back to normal. School started back up again, but summer came fast. I was glad because being in school felt like I was locked inside all over again. And we just celebrated my 13th birthday. <laughs> I'm really glad I didn't have to have a birthday party inside and without any friends. That would be so sad. My dad and I still watch scary movies sometimes, but after living through our own personal horror film, they've kind of lost their flair. I finally got to the hospital. I was eight weeks pregnant and I had no idea. My emotions were everywhere and the only person I truly wanted around was my mother. I tried to fight it, but I broke down and reached out to her. She'd heard about the lockdown and wanted so badly to call me, but she didn't think I wanted to hear from her. When I told her about my baby, she was thrilled. She rushed into town. She even helped out at holidays. It was fun to have her in the bar. Seeing her, hugging her, it gave me this perfect peace. Eventually, everything in town went back to normal. Uh, a new normal, I suppose. I missed working, so having the customers back smiling and dancing to the jazz all night brought tears to my eyes. I still remember everything like it happened yesterday, but life goes on. I have more important things to focus on now. I'm about to be a mom and that's all I care about. When they gave the all clear, Jeremy and I agreed to wait one more day before going out. And when we did, it was fantastic. Sitting in traffic had never felt better, I swear. Bentley couldn't wait to see his friends, and he even got Braylon excited for pre-K, even though that's about a year away. With the conspiracy theories, the blog took a turn during the lockdown, and you know what? I'm glad. It made me realize it was time to let the blog go. It was time to be more present with my family, with Jeremy. We got back to having date nights and weekend trips. It feels like I'm actually married again. I think the whole town was so happy to get back to normal that we gave up on getting answers for a while. But now that there's been a few months to let it all sink in, I've heard some people are working together to take a petition to Mayor Aquino. They want answers. Our lives were turned upside down for a month, and I agree, we deserve to know why. A tremendous explosion rocks a small Texas town. A mysterious factory closed for decades, obliterated from the map in seconds. 
mysterious green mist rises from the blast site. And finally, a strange government agency closes the entire town down for four long weeks. A strange series of occurrences. The residents of Cranesville have been left with no closure. They have received no answers. It is said that time heals all wounds. For the townspeople of this close community, time is their only solace. Time to cherish, time to reflect, time to adapt to a new normal. This has been the story of a blast in Cranesville. <laughs>